when plans started to have a women's march in Washington and indeed throughout the United States and around the world, the organizers suggested that they would be wearing hand-knitted pink pussy hats. And this idea did not go uncriticized. One feminist writer penned an editorial for the Washington Post which began, sisters, back away from the pink. He said, matters facing women now are extremely serious and wearing cute little pink hats is just going to trivialize the issue. So I had already started working on a book and exhibition on pink at that point. But that really made me think, why is pink regarded as such an unserious color? What is it about pink that's so controversial? Because uh, it's often been thought of as sort of the most controversial color. It certainly is one that people either love, and not only six-year-old girls, or hate. Um, in Japan, it's one of the most popular colors. In Europe, it's the second least popular color. Only about 2.5% of people polled say that pink is their favorite color. Uh, in the United States, it's somewhere in between, but people tend to have very strong feelings about it. So, inspired by the work of Michel Pastoreau, the greatest color historian, whose books on black and blue and uh, the colors of our lives and the psych social psychology of color, I started to investigate the history of pink. First thinking that it would be sort of from Madame de Pompadour to pussy hats, but then in realizing that I had to at least try and grapple with the rest of the world. And indeed, it turns out that if you go into Asian history, you find that pink has a much longer and more illustrious history. So here you see a, a Tang Dynasty figure, and the clothing as well as the makeup uh, are made of red dye. And this was quite common throughout India, China, Japan. The dyes were fairly fugitive, but were also very popular, both for makeup and for dyeing clothes, and were worn by both men and women. Some of these dyes came to Europe, and you did see the beginning of some use of pink dyed clothing in the European Middle Ages, for, again, for men as well as for women, but only a little bit. You didn't see a lot of this. And Pastoreau argues that in Western cultures, pink tended to be seen as just a pale shade of red. It didn't really have any significance as a color in and of itself. That began to change in the 18th century when a new type of dye, a related type of Brazilian dye, was discovered in South America. And it revolutionized dyeing in Europe because the color that it created was a brighter and a much longer lasting pink. It was so important economically that an entire country, Brazil, was named after this dye. And of course, the new color was avidly picked up by the French court, because Paris and the French court were the most trend-setting place in Europe, where novelty and new fashions were absolutely crucial. So these new dye, the juxtaposition of the city of Paris, and also the patronage of Madame de Pompadour uh, helped bring pink into fashion. It was fashionable in clothes. This is a, a miniature uh, court dress, which was done for a fashion doll. Before they had fashion magazines, they sent dolls around with the latest fashions on them. In our exhibition, we have this beautiful 18th century dress uh, from the Los Angeles County Museum. And I should tell you, the organization of the exhibition, I hope you'll go across the street and see it, is in two rooms. The first room is the pink you know for sure, mid-19th century to late 20th century, the feminine girly pink. And then the second room, where we go back in time to the 18th century and we go to other cultures around the world and right up to the present, brings you aspects of the pink you may or may not know. Because uh, this 18th century pink was not just a color for women. It was very much a color for both men and women, boys and girls. It sometimes mistakenly said, oh, pink is for girls now, but it used to be for boys. That is not true. If you go back to the 18th century, it was for both genders. Um, you see it in 
extant garments, and we have two men's suits in pink in the exhibition. You see it in fashion illustrations, in paintings. It's not only in fashion, it's also part of the visual arts. So someone like Boucher, Fragonard, lots and lots of pink. Notice the emphasis on sort of pink parts and, and pink blushing on Caucasian skin. You see it also in the decorative arts, like porcelain. In only one way is pink really signaled as feminine, and that is in conjunction with makeup, and particularly with the idea of blushes against white skin. So the idea in the 18th century was that if you blushed, it meant that you were an innocent person who suddenly had an awareness of something sexual. Uh, on the other hand, if you were painting on false blushes, it probably meant you were so hardened and cynical that you were incapable of being shocked by anything. So uh, it was worn by aristocratic ladies at court, but it was also associated with prostitution. And indeed, uh, that early image that I showed from China, the Tang Dynasty lady, there too there was an ambivalence that makeup in pink started to be seen as feminine and, and definitely associated with prostitutes and courtesans. Too much makeup uh, indicated that you were involved in some way in the sex trade. Here you have a beautiful modern Sevres by Cindy Sherman where she's sort of impersonating Madame de Pompadour. So this is the earlier, when pink was for men and women and didn't have gender connotations. By the 19th century, uh, you really see the feminization of color in general and the feminization of pink. And this dress starts off the first room where we look through changing shades of pink. And in the first room, I encourage people to think about the different names that we have for different shades of pink. Baby pink, ballet slipper pink, Barbie pink, blush pink, um, candy pink, hot pink, shocking pink. Many of them have to do with ideas about women or femininity. Why did pink become feminized? The simple answer is that because men's clothing gave up on color and decoration in the 19th century. A very complex phenomenon having to do with the rise of capitalism and democracy. So pink was not the only feminine color. Women wore blue and yellow and green, and, but gradually over time, pink does become an important color for females. Now, after, after I um, had finished writing the book, I found some of the earliest references to pink versus blue that I've ever seen. Uh, the earliest one I'd found prior to that was um, from Little Women, where there's the scene in Little Women where there are twins born, and Amy says, we're putting a pink ribbon on the girl and a blue ribbon on the boy, so that way you can, t in the French fashion, so that way you can tell them apart. So that book's published after the Civil War. Um, I went back and found in French fashion magazines that yes, indeed, you did have advertisements for baptismal clothes with blue and pink ribbons that way. But then I also found in the 1840s in La Presse an account of a fancy dress ball. And some people wore the typical black domino, a hooded cape over their costume. But one group of young men and women had it where the men were wearing sky blue and the women were wearing pink. That's the earliest I found of the pink and blue pairing. And I don't know where that came from. Um, but one of the key reasons that pink, I think, became so feminized had to do with the association of pink with pink parts. Now, men as well as women have genitals, lips, tongues, nipples, but in male-dominated society, the sexual object is, tends to be thought of as a woman or as a younger effeminate male. So I think this association of pink parts, which we can see right back, there's poetry in the 19th century where people are referring to pink parts of the body. This brassiere by Paul Poiré from the 1920s. Of course, Schiaparelli's a high-heeled shoe, again bringing some phallic symbolism with a, her collaboration with Salvador Dali. We see it throughout the art world. So with the Tom Wesselman, again, we're seeing the idea of pink as being idealized color for Caucasian female skin, and then brighter pink for things like nipples and lips. We see it a lot 
in intimate garments, beginning particularly in the later 19th century. So here in Manet's uh, painting referring to the census, you have her in a pink dressing gown or peignoir. It's an intimate kind of clothing that would only have been worn in private. And you also find it coming in in lingerie in the later part of the 19th century. Now in the middle of the 19th century, in the discourse on women's underwear, the emphasis is that it should always be white for purity. And when in the 1870s, actresses and courtesans started wearing colorful lingerie, again, you think of Manet's Nana, where she's wearing her blue satin corset. This was seen as being very shocking. Only the aristocracy of vice would wear clothing that was colorful underwear. This was seen as being deeply sexually neurotic. But within 10 years, it had caught on, and all kinds of fashionable women wore corsets in blue and pink and red. But again, this fetishization, as it were, of pink and of pink satin has been largely forgotten today, where we think of fetish in terms of things like black leather. But we're reminded of it when you think of something like uh, the Jean-Paul Gaultier cone bra corset that Madonna wore in her um, famous tour, this idea then that pink is associated with nudity, female sexuality, pink parts, that it's the exposed color, has been built into our ideas about the color for quite a long time. There are, of course, pink things in nature, such as flowers, and quite early on you started to find fashion designers imagining women as being like flowers. So that we have this beautiful Charles James uh, evening dress. Nobody studies botany anymore, but in the past, people were quite aware that flowers were the sex organs of plants and that the, they were colored and scented in order to attract pollinators. Flowers were also associated with the fleetingness of time and beauty. So the idea again of woman as flower implies that a woman's beauty, like a flower's beauty, is very temporary. Then there's also the association of fruits and with sweet things often being pink. So again, you have this idea of the association of the sweetness of sexuality and the idea of sweetness and candies when you go to the exhibition, you'll see that some of the wall texts, I wanted it to be different shades of pink. It ended up, I think, looking too much like a tequila sunrise. But that does at least indicate the idea that it's, a, it's always thought of as being like a sweet and sexy color. In children's clothing, as I said, you do have early on the idea that pink was for girls and blue was for boys. But when it gets to the United States, that gets very confused. Um, this is a little boy's outfit, which is pink, from 1895. And this is the same little boy. Um, when children's clothes started to be advertised uh, and marketed by department stores in the late 19th and early 20th century, this idea of gender coloring infants and then children's clothes became really popular. Traditionally, you'd had most of these clothes white so you could wash them easily, but now it seemed that you could sell better. And different advertisers and different journalists took different takes on it. So in 1918 in Philadelphia, the Infants Department, which was a magazine produced for a department store, said that there'd been a lot of discussion about which color went with which gender. But most people had decided that since pink was a more vivid and stronger color, it was more appropriate for the boy, whereas blue was a sort of more sweet and delicate color and therefore more appropriate for the girl. It really wasn't that simple because then a few years later, Time Magazine mentioned that there was a little prince was being had been born in Brussels and they were dressing the, lay the layette in pink because they said, well, over there it's pink for a boy. And people wrote in and said, pink for a boy? Why, in our family, it's always been pink for girls and blue for boys. So there was argument back and forth. And in 1927, Time Magazine found out that when they polled different department stores all over America, it was 50-50 which ones thought it was pink for girls and blue for boys, or the other way around. 
But they were all sure that there was a gender binary somewhere in there. It was pink versus blue. I think one reason in this country it tilted towards blue for boys has to do with the sale to a millionaire and the publicity surrounding blue boy and pinky. So that when there was all these articles about them and discussion about them, and people started to say, oh look, all the way back in the 18th century, it was always blue for boys and pink for girls. Now, of course, if he'd happened to buy Pink Boy, it might have been a different story. But Pink Boy was already in the Rothschild collection. So in a way, it became accidental that it went this way. But clearly, there was a very strong desire on some people's parts to market there being a gender binary in clothes. This became stronger and stronger uh, from the mid 20th century on. Uh, as women were being pushed back into the home after World War II, uh, you increasingly had more and more uh, emphasis on pink being for girls, women, and the home. And mothers were encouraged to dress their children in pink and buy them pink toys so that everyone would know they were girls and they would get in touch with their essential femininity. There was another big push in the 1980s, but indeed this pinkification of girl culture, which is uh, epitomized in this wonderful image of a little Korean girl with all of her pink things, ji and her pink things, inspired me to do a whole diorama in the exhibition where I have borrowed pink clothes and toys ranging from 1950 to the present, and we filled an entire gallery sort of space with them as a sort of Instagrammable moment about the pinkification of girl culture in the, over the course of the 20th century. Back in the first room, we also look at changing colors. I showed you that first crinoline dress, which was in bright pink. As dyes, artificial dyes were used, you could get brighter and cheaper pinks. And so then elite people started to think that was too cheap looking. And they said, you know, all these servant girls wearing their pink and lilac clothes. So they went back to our, what they believed was a more refined, aristocratic, 18th century pale pink. But since fashion is nothing if not a pendulum effect, that quickly swung over to being a brilliant kind of pink. And designers like Paul Poiret said, all oh, those wishy-washy colors, those pale mauves, those nuances of nymph's thigh. We have to throw those out in favor of a few wild wolves, colors like cherry and peacock and lemon yellow. Then there was, of course, another uh, turn away from that with Chanel saying that all those colors made her feel nauseated and she wanted to bring in black and beige and navy blue instead. A number of people associated pink also with Eastern cultures. So you see women wearing like an example of a Chinese jacket because people did recognize that pink was a very popular color in the East. We have an, a group of these little pink dresses from the 20s and I discovered in my research that, you know, of course Chanel was not the only one or even the first one to do a little black dress but everybody was also doing little pink dresses, including Chanel. So the second to closest to me, the very pale pink one, is a Chanel. But pink was a wildly popular color in the 1920s. And of course in the 1930s, with Schiaparelli's shocking pink, it became also really sort of the color of the decade. We have a number of beautiful Schiaparelli's in the exhibition, uh, both from period Scaparelli and from the modern house of Scaparelli. But one thing I found out in the course of my research, which was no one has ever pointed out to my knowledge, is there's a difference between Scaparelli's uh, English and American editions of her book, Shocking Life. In the English edition, in both of them, she talks about how she suddenly envisioned this shocking, brilliant color that was a color of China and of Peru, not a color of the West. In the American edition, she just goes, color was a huge success. But in the English edition, she has a couple of sentences where she shows this color not of the West to her colleagues, and they go, oh, you can't use that color. Black people wear that color, only using a, a racial slur. And she goes, what, but, but black people are often very stylish. And that got me thinking. In fact, was this a color that in addition to being popular in Asia 
and popular in Latin America was also popular within the African diaspora. And I found that in many ways it was, both in African American culture, Afro-Caribbean culture, and that led to some very interesting paths which we follow in the second half of the exhibition. But for now, hold that aside because the front room, remember, is just sort of the Euro-American view of color. As you're marching through, you find in the 50s, as again, as pink is just the dominant color for women. It becomes really labeled as being for women. And if you've seen Funny Face, you see the fashion editor going, you know, bury the beige, banish the black, just think pink. And suddenly everything is pink. We have the video playing uh, in the exhibition. And all of the little girls are the, at the fashion uh, journal are suddenly in pink, except for Miss Prescott, the fashion editor, who continues to wear a black or charcoal gray suit. And one of the girls says to her, but Miss Prescott, you're not wearing pink. And she goes, I wouldn't dream of it. So you have fashion designers at the high, highest level producing gorgeous pink gowns, like Christian Dior, who said after black, pink was his favorite color. We have this ravishing Dior um, Venus dress in the exhibition. The very erotic Jacques Faf laced up the back like a corset with Norman Norell and numerous other uh, designers producing pink. There were also, again, pink for the home, woman assigned to the interior. There was even some pink for men. Brooks Brothers pink shirts, rock and roll guys, younger guys wore pink jackets. Um, so you had, you had some pink if you went down to the tropics and vacationed. So little bits of pink were even creeping into the men's wardrobe, indicating that there were alternatives to the overwhelming femininity that was the primary message of pink in the middle of the 20th century in the USA. Mrs. Freeland, the uh, editor-in-chief of Vogue, famously said pink is the navy blue of India. And the idea that pink was a color popular in Eastern culture began to impinge on Western awareness so that you see pink being worn in fashion photographs which are set in India. In fact, anyone who goes to India sees that pink is a color worn by both men and w as well as women. When you look into African American culture, you find that it's not just Elvis Presley, who had a pink Cadillac and a pink bedroom and a pink jackets, but someone like Sugar Ray Robinson, the boxer, was also embracing pink. That, again, if you look at the work of uh, painters in Harlem, you start to see that pink is much more acceptable for men in the African-American community, and also in the Afro-Caribbean community. There's testimonial from people who moved from Jamaica to London in the middle of the 20th century where they described how they were so shocked at how drably the English dressed and the English were so shocked at how brightly and colorfully they dressed. The 60s continue to be at least as pink as the 50s. You have pink in all the fashion magazines, you have fashion reporters like saying, I don't know why we even bother to talk about black. All anyone's doing is wearing pink, peach pink, rose pink, baby pink, bright pink. Just as Mamie Eisenhower was seen as being, you know, wearing first lady pink, so also was Jackie Kennedy. The 70s was not a pink decade, except when it came to Barbie. Barbie, who had been hitherto been extremely fashionably dressed in little miniatures of high fashion, suddenly began being marketed for much younger girls and much brighter, glittery pink. She also had a much bigger, toothier smile and gradually was being transformed into a very different kind of doll. Ebony Fashion Fair, also testimonial from that, the organizers talked about how they were very into showing brilliant colors, including bright pink, uh, as part of African-American fashion. Meanwhile, we wouldn't have any kind of music if it hadn't been for the African-American influence. So popular music from rock and roll and Elvis Presley to the punks took a great deal from African-American music. Here you have uh, the sign for Vivian Westwood's shop, Sex. Uh, and again, just like the giant letters uh, above Sugar Ray Robinson's restaurant. And the 
lead bass guitarist for The Clash, the punk group, said that pink was the only true rock and roll color. So you're getting the development of a kind of rock and roll, punk, later also a hip hop color. Some designers stayed with pink, like we borrowed this wonderful Yves Saint Laurent with the giant pink bow in the back. What the French talked about how you had the uh, romance and sweetness of pink along with the brilliance of black, and they called this the perfect duo of love. In general, though, that for most Americans, the idea was that pink was the princess color. And so when you see something like on the red carpet, Gwyneth Paltrow wearing the uh, Ralph Lauren pink dress, which we have in the exhibition, this is the image that comes up. It's an image which is almost parodied in Japan with the girl culture there, the Lolita culture, where everything that's uh, pale pink and roughly and cute is created. But all of that then is picked up by avant-garde artists and designers like Rei Kawakubo, who begin questioning the little girl aesthetic. And so do Japanese artists who have uh, wonderful works about like, nice little girls' dressing room, which are questioning the real Japanese obsession with pink. Japanese were among the first to start also doing dyed pink hair, and that whole girl culture was a kind of very special Japanese take on punk. Within LGBTQ culture also, pink was embraced by a queer faction from the 70s on, taking the pink triangle, which the Nazis had used to label male homosexuals, and reappropriating it as a sign of gay pride and AIDS activism. Meanwhile, in India, a group of low caste women formed the Pink Sari Gang, where dressing in inexpensive pink saris, they would protest and put pressure on men who were abusing women or abusing low caste people. So this is taking a very feminist, politicized use of pink and bringing it back into the heartland of a culture where pink has long been a traditional color. You have Code Pink, the leftist woman's NGO. Very importantly, you have uh, members of the hip hop community who appropriate pink. Cameron, the Harlem rapper, wore pink mink to New York Fashion Week in 2002, launching an absolutely unending trend for male rappers to wear pink. Of course, you have Lil' Kim, you have Rihanna when she did uh, Fenty times Puma. Within Africa itself, you have a whole uh, sapeur movement and a number of designers who are working on pink for men as well as women. The idea of pink and the ballerina is being brought into new phases, particularly as the idea of the ballerina itself is being expanded to women of multiple races and to the idea that ballerinas are not just sort of weak little girl toys, but in fact are athletes and disciplined performers. So over the course of the exhibition, we look at a variety of these different aspects of modern pink fashion, whether it's sexy as underwear, whether it's someone like Jeremy Scott, who is sort of ironically picking up on Barbie as being, again, a kind of queer icon of femininity. The whole millennial pink phenomenon of all kinds of high fashion designers picking up on pink and young women picking up on pink saying, why shouldn't we be able to wear pink? It's looked down on because of its association with women and girls, but is there some way that we can appropriate that just the way gays have appropriated pink? It's entered into all kinds of decor now for interiors, for restaurants. Designers like Mucha Prada are using it, saying, can you be strong in pastels? Is that possible? At Gucci as well, we're seeing it for men as well as women in a kind of new maximalist aesthetic. In Celine, the intelligent woman's designer, you're seeing sort of lipstick fluid pink as though appropriating again, saying that it's not a stupid, unserious color. And probably most importantly, we're seeing it with Rei Kawakubo of Comme des Garçons, who takes in her 18th century punk collection the idea of powerful aristocratic 
individual women in France and translating it to 21st century women so that flowers now are no longer for the woman who's just being sort of plucked by a man, but instead are on a kind of armored samurai-like um, uniform or picking up onto uh, the idea of a, a skirt with panniers, instead a pleather ensemble with the broad shoulders and the panache and sheer taking up space of a woman of the 18th century. All of, in all of these ways, by drawing on international ideas, by drawing on the past, by drawing on pink as a color of protest and rebellion and rock and roll, people today have reconfigured pink. Going back to the main idea I have for the exhibition, which is really that, as Michel Pastoreau says, there's no trans-historical truth about color. It's society that makes color and creates its meaning. So that as it's made, it can be unmade and remade. And what we're seeing now is a questioning of all of those stereotypes of femininity that have been associated with pink for so long and a broadening of the association so that pink can be not only pretty, but also punk, powerful, cool, androgynous, and global. Thank you very much. If, you, if someone can turn the lights on, I'm happy to take questions from the audience. And then I think they have books as well, uh, so I'm happy to sign books. Are there any questions? I hope there's some questions, or I'll feel that I've really had a boring speech. Yes, thank you. Questioning about the orange and pink. Pink technically is thought of as being red and white mixed together. In point of fact, there are a range of colors which are regarded as part of the pink family. And on the pink-orange side, there are a number of peachy pinks, which can be read either as orange or as pink, but are often included. Like in the 1960s, peach was very much thought of as pink. Um, and then on the other side, you've got the magentas, which are heavily blue and which are really almost a mixture of blue and red together, making for a very dark color, but that's also considered to be part of the pink family. This question of the sort of what is pink is one of the most interesting questions because there's so many different shades which are included in it. And many books on fashion don't mention pink at all. It's such a kind of anomalous color. Many languages had no word for pink until very recently because pink was thought of as just kind of the bastard child of red and white. Uh, so, for example, in English, the color pink didn't, was not a color term until the 17th century. Prior to that, it was referring to a kind of little flower, the pink. Um, and when in Romeo and Juliet, Mar Mercutio says, I'm in the very pink of health, he's not referring to little rosy cheeks. He means he's in the flower of health. And similarly in French with rose, it doesn't mean pink until the 18th century. That's the first time that dictionaries use it as a color term as opposed to just being a flower term. But the ancient Greek has no word for pink. Latin had no word for pink. But by contrast, Chinese and Japanese had probably the earliest word for pink because red was so important for the Japanese. They had a lot of, of words for different shades of red. And then early on, they started inventing multiple words for pink. So there's a pink that's referred to as a cherry blossom pink. There's a peach pink. And then most recently, there's the loan word from English, pinku, which refers to foreign pink. So uh, it's sort of like the joke about Eskimos and the word for snow. The more important it becomes to your culture, the more words you start to have for it. Thank you. Another question. Yes.
I guess I'm always, I've always been personally interested in things that were controversial in fashion. So I got into fashion because a classmate gave a presentation on two articles in a scholarly feminist journal about the corset. One saying it was sexually oppressive and dangerous and the other saying it was liberating for women. And I love the fact that the corset was a, such a controversial garment in the history of fashion. I was attracted to pink partly because I was getting interested in color, reading all of this books about color, but I was really attracted because pink was a controversial color. People either really loved it or they really hated it. And because they, the dislike for it and the like for it had so much to do with them thinking about women and the conflicted ideas about women. And then as it turned out also, a lot of conflicted ideas about race and class were mixed in with attitudes towards pink. Who would wear pink? and this would be looked down on. So that, that was what I was interested in. Of course, as a fashion historian, I've seen their beautiful, all kinds of magnificent, beautiful pink dresses, but I was curious into how, curious into thinking about how our ideas of pink have changed. And so I wanted to get people away from just assuming that the stereotypes of pink were true for all times and places. Because a lot of people have thought that, even I've read sci scientific articles that say girls like pink because they're hardwired to like pink because back in evolutionary history, the men were out hunting and the women were gathering fruit and ripe fruit was kind of an orangey pink color and so they're programmed to be, and I'm like, no, <laughs> no. They didn't play with like pink toys until recently. It's only recently that that's been pushed on little girls. So I was astonished at how people could be so manipulated or so confused about something that they would think something had gone on forever in all times and places since prehistory. So that was what the, the inspiration for doing it. Question up there. Yes, you. Well, there's matter. You can get it from matter. You can get it from uh, cochineal um, and brazilium. Another question. Anything else? Okay. It's hard to see people on the top. Yes, there. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's only women and some um, very outrageous homosexual men who would wear rouge. Yes, there. I can't really speak to that. I couldn't find any clear relevant information and I did plow through a lot of scientific works on that, but I don't, I don't know is the answer to that. Yes, question here. Well, nobody expected this trend for millennial pink to last for so long. I mean, it was, millennial pink was not named until 2016 in New York Magazine, but it had been going on is a growing trend in fashion for at least two years and probably more like four years prior to that. And I assumed when I was working on the book that pink would be totally dead in the water by the time the show opened. And yet there's still pink on the runways and people are appearing in pink in music videos, et cetera. It's tending to be now not the millennial pink, not that dusty uh, kind of uh, dusty rose. Instead, it's a whole range, everything from watermelon to lavender pink is a new, really touted one. So although the trend is slowly fading, I think the fact that it's been picked up by so many men has in a way permanently changed the layers of meaning that have been deposited on pink. I'm sure that it will go into a decline, since it's been going on for so long now, 
inevitably it has to be sort of disappearing for a while. But I expect that like other like other themes in fashion, it will keep re-emerging then every few years, and we'll see how different designers will treat it differently. Some of the uptown type, more straight designers will look at it still as a pretty feminine color, and some of the more uh, street or rock and roll designers will be asking other questions about it, and it will continue to have other resonance. But I w was quite amazed, really, at how rapidly it has invaded all kinds of menswear. It's a little bit like uh, men wearing earrings, which when I was young in the 70s was absolutely unheard of. I mean, even, even hipsters were shocked by that. I remember Larry Rivers, the painter, his son Stephen got his ear pierced. And Larry was a heroin addict and a jazz musician and the ultimate kind of hipster guy. And he was shocked and horrified. But then all these guys started getting into their inner pirate and getting pierced ears. And suddenly it became totally normative. And I think that's what we're seeing with pink with men, that as it's being picked up by more musicians and performers, at just as, and in sports, you're seeing more sport, uh, sportsmen wearing pink, it's shed a lot of the candy, cute, weak imagery that had been associated with it for so long. One more question. There was something else. Somebody else had one more in the middle. There. Very, very interesting. And the, the idea of having things in pink, I think, with the accretion of symbolism, sorry, um, it's like a palimpsest with layer and layer on meaning, of meaning. And when you start to see things that seem anomalous or strange done in pink, it just does add one more layer to it. When you look at the um, little pan diorama that I did of all the pink girls' toys, some of them are so stereotyped. It's like a little pink washer dryer, a little pink kitchen set. So you're really seeing how girls are being encouraged to go into feminine things. But then you'll also see things like a bright magenta pink guitar. And so you'll say, okay, that's the, from the rock and roll pink aspect. So it would be very interesting if uh, pink acquired also specific monetary thing, meaning. You have, of course, the whole idea of pink collar work as sort of working class comparison with blue collar work and you have the idea of the pink tax where women are paying more for having the same thing done like more for a woman's blouse um, dry clean than a man's shirt mm -mm. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, if, oh, sorry a couple more questions some say the French Rococo use of pastels um, both blue and pink reflect the weakness and effeminacy of the French aristocracy how would I respond to that? I'd say that is you're projecting back into the 18th century post-French Revolution ideas that those colors were effeminate colors. They were not prior to that time. They were aristocratic colors. So again, the meaning of something can change. So the pale pinks and pastels then were just seen as colors of the aristocracy, of the elite. And they were not seen as being effeminate, except perhaps by British nationalists who would look over and claim that the French were on the one hand trying to conquer the world and on the other hand insidiously trying to make the British all weak and effeminate. Um, did men in 18th century, no that's Rouge one, we've got that. Um, you pointed out the various contexts of viewing pink in different societies. Could you expand on this? Did pink have a special meaning in Asian culture or religion, i.e. white culture? No, it, um, it seems to be associated in, at least in China and Japan, with um, in a range of colors associated with red, so along the kind of happiness contingent. In China, there's, a very, uh, there's definitely a connection with makeup also. And in Japan, very much a, a nature connection. A lot of the words relating to pink often have to do with flowers and plants. So that is some kind of a difference. But I tried to, um, I tried to get some 
components internationally. My husband's a Chinese scholar, and I did reach out to other Japanese scholars. The book has a whole essay about pink in Japan, an essay by Tanya about pink in Mexico. But I was sort of trying to bring in aspects of it as I did the research, and I'm not an expert in pink in East Asia. Um, I can be here for a little bit longer. I'm supposed to go upstairs and sign books, so I want to thank you again for coming here. If you want to look at the book, it's upstairs. Thanks a lot.